I think if you're not from here, you don't understand the magnitude of it. But I think I found something that sort of sums us up as a city. Right. It's out there in the Pittsburgh airport. You've both probably seen this a thousand times. It's in the main terminal. There's two huge statues. One is of George Washington. Of the other one is of Franco Harris. <laughs> Everybody from Pittsburgh's like, oh, yeah, that's normal. Let's go catch our flight. Wait a second, he's the first president of the United States of America. He was a first round draft pick in 1972. <laughs> he beat the Redcoats for God's sake. Like, he beat the Raiders, okay? It's pretty well documented, it was immaculate. Everybody saw it. The people that aren't from here, they're like, what? The father of our nation and a guy that caught a football off somebody's helmet 40 years ago? And we're like, yeah. yeah. It's been 40 years since Franco Harris worked what's been called the miracle of all miracles. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And that, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. And the play has been a mystery ever since. From out of nowhere came Franco Harris, riding a white stallion, heading up Franco's Italian army, and galloping off into the sunset. This is the story of a play that's lived a life of its own. You gonna be a football player when you go away? Today is the best day of your life. Believe it. He might be the finest quarterback in Purdue in the last 10 years. He is a day like this. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. Rest of your life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. The Immaculate Reception is a myth, a miracle, a cottage industry, a conspiracy, a crime, and a detective story. Now the ball is clearly beyond Fuqua. But before it became all these things, it was just a football play. The last desperate hope of a team and a town that had always been destined to lose. And now it is all wrapped up in this one. It is fourth down, still 10 to go. Pittsburgh's ball at their own 40-yard line, 22 seconds left to play. A situation like this, of course, is all to the advantage of the defense. Bradshaw must put it in the air. Back goes Bradshaw. He's looking, he's in trouble back there. He rolls out to the right. I'm laying on the ground. I heard the roar, huge roar. It definitely was our roar. I'm going, you son of a gun, boy. You, you, you pulled this sucker off. And I got up and started going. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> People have been asking that question ever since. Franco Harris crossed the goal line at approximately 3.29 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For 15 full minutes, the referee Fred Swearingen and his five-man crew deliberated over the play. And the officials talking down along the goal line, both teams are gathered down around there. There was no indication whether or not it was a score because nobody saw what took place. So Fred Swearingen, the head official, pulled it. all the other officials together, and Fred Swearingen said, what happened? When I turned to our sideline, I saw Madden going crazy, and I felt like saying, coach, 
he caught the ball. I had no clue about this double hit rule. It's rule seven, section five, article two, item one. The first player to touch the pass, he only continues to be eligible for A, in other words, for, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You could not have a double touch. If you could, when that hand went up, if he touched the ball, as soon as the second player on his team touched the ball, incomplete pass. That's the end of it. We're still waiting to see whether or not we're going to get an extra point attempt. In the history of football, when a guy crosses a goal line, it's either a touchdown or it's not. They didn't call a touchdown. They didn't know if it was a touchdown. I went out, they said, get away, we don't know what happened. So now the referee leaves that huddle and he goes over to the dugout on the Pittsburgh Steelers side and he gets on the phone and he makes a call to someone. Then he hangs up, then he walks out into the middle field and says touchdown, five or 10 minutes later. They said that they didn't look at replays they didn't do anything. There was a question among the officials of what, happened, what the rule was on the simultaneous hit. That's yeah. well, a hell of a gun. This game has to go down to someone up in the first row. And then I still don't know who he made the call to because I won't admit it. No one knows. Of all the investigations and investigative reporters, no one knows who that guy talked to and, and what was said on that telephone call. That question has never been answered to this day. You go that? ask someone. They don't know. The play had lasted for just 17 seconds. Tens of thousands witnessed it, but nobody saw it. The Steelers have defeated Oakland 13 to 7. An incredible finish and a play that will be talked about for years in pro football. People are still talking about it today, 40 years later. Coming up. The Immaculate Reception and the film of it became the Zapruder film of, of sports. I don't know if I got knocked down or what, but I look up and Franco's just taking that Italian army right down the side. <laughs> the mythologizing of the Immaculate Reception began shortly after the final gun in Pittsburgh's locker room. Do you remember now the ball coming to you? Is it I don't know, like I uh, seen it bounce off and I just, you know, looked up and I just put my hands out. And, the press you know, was wild. I guess my hands. Some of them were smart enough to come over and talk to Frenchie and they said, well, Frenchie, uh, can you explain what happened exactly? He said, well, the ball bounced off my chest. And I knew that that's not the right answer. Frenchie didn't know the rule and he just was talking. He didn't really know what happened because he got hit in the head. And I grabbed him and said, Frenchie, no, what you meant to say was... After the game, Frenchie came over, came into the locker room, and he leaned over to me, and he said in my ear, he said, you know that ball hit me. I said, yeah, I know the ball hit you. He said, yeah, it did hit me, but that's the way it goes. And uh, that's a true statement. Seven days later, the plot thickened when a new angle of the play emerged on the nationally syndicated Game of the Week. From another angle, we can see that one stroke of luck, that one moment of poise, that one bounce of the ball that spells the end for one team and gives another life. The iconic image captured by Ernie Ernst's camera in the north end zone, when spliced together with the camera of Jay Gerber, who'd been positioned at midfield, created the enduring image of the play, an image that would be replayed millions of times. The Immaculate Reception and the film of it became like uh, what I like to think of the Zapruder film of, of sports. So the Zapruder film was uh, the film of the Kennedy assassination shot in Dealey Plaza. Conspiracy theories being what they are, 
and the assassination of a president being what it is, that film has been analyzed and dissected and argued about more than any other you know, short piece of film in history. Similarly, the film of the Immaculate Reception has been poured over in just the same way as the, as the Pruder film, frame by frame, image by image, idea by idea, to look for incontrovertible proof that the play was not legitimate. Folks look at it, and with, with every viewing, they want to take a new meaning from it. I mean, just, just think of everything that had to happen just so. And, and almost every one of those just so's had to be unplanned. You, you can see the fascination. You can understand it. Franco Harris's touchdown was shrouded in mystery and had an image that would become iconic. But to become a play for the ages, it needed a name. And it was christened the night of the game by this man in a Pittsburgh tavern. This was the synchronicity of universal events. It was destined to happen, it was going to happen, we just didn't know it was gonna happen. Growing up Catholic, I remember the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And I thought, damn. So I climbed up on a table, and like you do at an old fire hall wedding, you know, I got a spoon and I banged on a glass. I would like to uh, suggest that from this day on, we refer to this day as the Feast of the Immaculate Reception. And the place went bonkers. Ord's girlfriend, Sharon Lavosky, called Myron Cope, a local sportscaster, and he pronounced Franco's catch immaculate that night on the 11 o'clock news. But it took a while to catch on. The team's sanctioned highlight film made no mention of the name. The Pittsburgh Steelers, division champions. It has a nice ring. None of Pittsburgh's newspapers referred to the play as the Immaculate Reception until September of 1973. And reporters outside of Pittsburgh didn't know what to call it. How about that play of yours, uh, the one that uh, enabled you to come out ahead? I, I didn't hear that name, I don't think, for a, at least a couple of years. Pittsburgh and Oakland have a bitter rivalry. Oakland got beat here in the deflection of Franco Harris. Remember the miraculous reception of Franco, and that happened here. Dan Rooney is about family, faith, and football, he didn't like the sound of immaculate reception. I mean, it sounded a little sacrilegious to him. Most of the media in Pittsburgh stayed away from it. There are commercials from a year later, two years later, where they talk about this tipped pass. That deflected pass in the last minute of the game put Pittsburgh in the playoffs. The it took a while before everyone embraced it. I remember hearing it for the first time, I think, in the, the first Super Bowl year, in 74, maybe. Remember the Immaculate Reception? I thought that was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. It was a stroke of genius. Once it was dubbed the Immaculate Reception, it kind of took on a life of its own. I mean, you saw it everywhere. The Immaculate Reception. The Immaculate, the immaculate reception. reception. Franco Harris's Immaculate Reception. The Immaculate Reception is the most famous play in NFL history. The name is important for why we recall it today as one of the you know, greatest moments in history. The Immaculate Reception as a name is a great name. So to call it like the Great Deflection or something, or you know, the improbable 22 second 66 circle option, I think the name mattered a lot. The catch. It's nice, it's in the memory of, it's a, it's a big play, but it doesn't have the pizzazz, it's not marketable, it, you know, it, the immaculate reception is so apropos. The reception you've given me has been uh, so wonderful here. You could almost call it an immaculate reception. Miracle and immaculate imply larger religious godlike implications. It's very weird that we've come to think of this play as something religious. People thought it was about the, the virgin birth. It wasn't about, it wasn't about Jesus. It was about the Immaculate Conception, where Mary is visited by an angel of God and therefore becomes pregnant without having been touched by sin. Here was the Immaculate Reception. Franco had received the ball, like the baby, it had not been touched 
by Frenchie Fuqua, because if it had, then the, the play wouldn't have been legal. Coming up. Public was deceived, officials deceived, and we got deceived. We don't call it the Immaculate Reception. We call it the Immaculate Deception. I think the Immaculate Reception definitely gained momentum in history because the Steelers then went on to win four Super Bowls in six years. It becomes like the cornerstone of this fantastic edifice that they began to build. Every great myth has an origin story to it. In the Greek gods and in, in the Bible, and there's always that story. It's opera, right? Or at least, you know, sports opera. That immaculate reception play, the reason that it caught on, it was proof that we weren't wrong. Our belief wasn't wrong. That somewhere above, there was a higher power that also felt that that team was worthy of winning. That play, if you're still a fan, you believe in it. If you're a sinner like the damn Raiders, uh, you'll never accept it. So it's almost like the Bible, a myth to some and a faith to others. The Immaculate Reception is such a seminal part of the Steel City's identity. The play has become the feature attraction at Pittsburgh's satellite of the Smithsonian Institution. This is a great moment of NFL history and American history. Anybody know what this is depicting? Immaculate Reception. More than 50,000 school kids come to the History Center every year. We don't indoctrinate them here at the History Center. It's fourth and 10, 22 seconds are remaining. Steelers have no timeouts. There's pretty much no hope of them winning this game. Okay, Bradshaw's the Steelers quarterback, under center takes a snap. You see the actual turf, and as you see the X up there, that is the spot where Franco caught the ball. That is the spot in American history happened right there. It's one of those things that people who come to the sports museum come and revere as they would uh, an icon or a relic. We also have the shoes that Franco was wearing that day. We take the same care with the tartan turf and Franco's shoes as we would things that are on loan from the Vatican or even the Declaration of Independence. The film of the Immaculate Reception plays at the History Center every five minutes, every day of the week, every day of the year. You just can't help but be mesmerized by that image. It's an image that made history. Unfortunately, in our culture, there's only one thing that matters is who wins. The winner writes the history book. The winner gets the Super Bowl trophy. The winner's the genius. You have to win. It's one of the great moments in uh, National Football League history. It's not a great moment in Raider history. The Immaculate Reception changed the Raiders forever, and the Silver and Black erected a myth of their own. We don't call it the Immaculate Reception. We call it the Immaculate Deception. You know, this is the 40th anniversary of the Immaculate Deception, as we call it here in Oakland. Sure, yeah. uh, the public was deceived, the officials deceived, and we got deceived. If you could have packaged all that anger and frustration, it probably would have been nuclear. <laughs> it probably would have been equivalent to a nuclear bomb. 40 years later, emotions are still raw, especially with John Madden. That play bothered me then, bothers me today, and will bother me until the day I die. They didn't call it a touchdown. The officials talked in the end zone, like right down there. And the referee goes over to the dugout, talks to someone on the phone. 15 minutes later, after the play comes out, and says, touchdown. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> your man, your man Fred Swearingen. Madden remained so upset, he refused to be interviewed for this documentary. 
like every Raider who experienced the play, he was permanently scarred. Anytime something would go wrong, of course they're going to think it was a conspiracy. You big jerk! You don't call You ever call one on them? The Raiders were able to use it as a motivation that led to the next 10 years during which no team won more games. The Super Bowl really exists for the Oakland Raiders. All along they've been thinking it was somebody's crazy illusion. And that all started in the seconds after the Immaculate Reception. Coming up. Swearingen had a problem. If he would have ever reversed that call, that man might have died. I've been the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, director of the National Security Agency, a career military officer, a career intelligence officer. I've looked at this play from every possible angle. I've looked at every stitch of documentary evidence. And in my professional judgment, that play, the Immaculate Reception, happened just the way it was called. There are some people out there who are just far too conspiratorial. Come on, what else are they gonna say? There was a vendetta against the Raiders. Here's what the truth and the facts of the matter are. There are three infractions that were never called, which leads to a conspiracy theory. The story that needs to be unraveled, if it ever can be, is the story from Frenchie Fuqua. Did it touch him or didn't it touch him? And only he knows. The question, Frenchie, did you touch the ball? Maybe, maybe not. He was knocked into the ball. Jack Tatum hit him from behind into the ball. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw Jack Tatum hit Fuqua right in the back. I saw the whiplash. I definitely, definitely hit Fuqua. That, I, I think, has been proven to be wrong. Films clearly show the ball was off of Tatum's body, not off of Frenchie's. Did Jack Tatum hit the ball? Did he, did he hit the ball at all? And it clearly showed that he did not he hit the Frankie shoulder pad and bounced off of that. If you look at the tape, Frenchie's like this. Frenchie's hands went out like this to catch the ball. There's no way with his hands stretched out, it didn't hit your hands and bounce back 20 feet or whatever it did pull out the micrometer as to, you know, whose hand or shoulder pad or helmet touched it, it's, it's, it's impossible to do. I, I would turn it on his head. When you look at it again and again, in no way do those films give conclusive evidence that Fuqua was the only one to touch the ball. If Tatum hits it before or after Frenchie does, it's good. Let's be honest. We never see the bottom tip of the ball. We never see the bottom half of the ball and whether or not it touches the turf. That seems to be the most legitimate conspiracy theory objection. And I asked Franco about it. Franco's been asked about it a lot. And uh, Franco doesn't give a straight answer. Did the ball hit the ground before you plucked it out of the air? I can't say. From the time Bradshaw threw the ball, it was like I lost all sense of consciousness. Before I knew it, I'm up and running. Before that, everything is just just a blur. Franco's a good ball player, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking him. He knew what had happened. You know, he knew he cut the ball off the ground. I saw it from an angle from across the field. The, the tip of the ball touched the ground. He trapped it. More than likely, because Franco doesn't speak, he probably trapped it on the ground. Nobody will ever say, Frenchie won't say, and Franco won't say, and I understand it's one of the greatest plays in the history of the sport. As long as we all sit here and say, well, did they touch it? Did they trap it? 
something that keeps it going. No, I, I saw that. Franco made a, a great catch. He got it in stride. You didn't see the effect of the ground on the ball. And the way Franco got it, it just seems as if it, it had been a continuous play. Once Franco got in the end zone, then he started getting piled on. And then people started jumping out of the sands. In fact, one guy broke his leg jumping out of the sand. It was a total, total mob scene. I think, if I recall, you never actually see a touchdown sign. Humankind does not have the ability to reverse that kind of thing. There is a very, very tough security situation here. Huge discussion going on down in the end zone. Enraged fans fearing that the touchdown might be disallowed are out on the sidelines. Oh, it was absolute mayhem. And given the absolute, I believe, fear that was in the hearts of the officials, I don't, I don't think, think they were going to change their decision. I know for a fact that those officials knew that that play was not a legal play. I did hear one of the officials say, how much security do we have? They asked the question, how much security do we have? They talked a little bit longer, head official goes out on the field, puts his hands up, touchdown. There was no control. It was crazy what was going on. Swearingen had a problem. I think if he would have ever reversed that call, that man might have died. And all the other officials, too. <laughs> Sounds good. Not true. Our guys couldn't care less about that. No, absolutely not. Look at Gerber frame 325. That'll tell you all you need to know. Look at McMakin's head. You can't see his head because there's a round in my back. I was clipped. We totally got screwed. I was, I was definitely clip. Fred Swearing and his group, they had no clue what was going on. They were afraid to throw flags at that time in the game. If it wasn't for that clip, I think I'd make that play, and we have no immaculate reception. No, it's always been clear in my memory that it was a clean block, the head and shoulders in front. That's why I call it the magnificent obstruction. I feel like, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good name for the block. That was no immaculate obstruction. That was an immaculate clip. I do think it's puzzling that he feels like it was a, a clip from behind. Well, if you look at Gerber frame 325, you can tell that uh, my head and shoulders are, are plainly visible, you know, in front of Phil. The conspiracy theories are troubling, and on some level, believable. But are they the most likely explanation for what occurred? Bachman's razor is a theory that suggests that more often than not, the simplest explanation for an event is probably the correct explanation. Very often we get very ornate trying to explain things, and more often than not, it's just what it is. It's just what it seems to be. I'll buy an Occam's razor on this one. When we return. In here rests the Immaculate Reception football. Once you've been declared immaculate, or once you've been declared the hero in a miracle story, when an event happens like that and it's frozen in history, um, it, there, there is a lot of burden to try to maintain the aura that surrounds it. How many times have folks asked you to describe the, the catch you made? Didn't you? <laughs> Quite a few times, <laughs> and it's still hard to answer, you know, what really happened. Could you Every day, in Franco's life, from December 23rd of 1972 till today, 
at least a dozen times a day, people will ask him, Franco, did you really score that touchdown? Who touched that ball? Do you think it was legal? Do you think that the famous catch still has tension with the Raiders? Did it hit you immediately how important that play would be to the franchise? What was your original role in the play that was called? Did you think the play was legal? Did the, uh, did the ball actually touch the ground? Did you have a special meal that day before the game? We, the observers of people who do these things that turn out to be momentous things, I don't think we have a very good grip on what it feels like to be them. I don't think it's so easy. And I think he handles it about as well as a human being can handle. At first it was quite strange and quite odd seeing the statue there. They told me it was going to be up there for six months. And here it is years later, and it's still up there. I hear at times some Raider fans go through there and try to knock the ball out of my hand. Beware, you better get some extra security by that statue. I'm not gonna miss my tackle again. That thing's coming down. In addition to the museum exhibits, the Immaculate Reception has spawned a cottage industry. Remember John McMakin, the tight end whose magnificent obstruction sprung Franco for the touchdown? He made the play the cornerstone of his business. I had this card made up, this statement, uh, we can't predict, we can't be prepared for the unexpected, which is what insurance is all about. People love using that name. How about the immaculate collection of furniture? I have one, it's a great chair. Franco did an ad for a phone company called the Immaculate Reception. The Immaculate Reception, like, you know, phone reception. Frenchie came out one time with the Immaculate Confection. This guy came up with a great idea, a candy bar. The Immaculate Confection. I said, what? Frenchie has made a living post-NFL, speaking at banquets. I'm gonna tell you some things that no one else knows. Basically, who touched the ball in the Immaculate Reception. And he teases you by saying, you know, tonight, I'm gonna finally tell you what happened on that play. What I tell you today, I'm gonna deny tomorrow. And he gets to the point where he's going to tell you, and then he says, you know what, I better not. I better not, I wanna, I wanna keep this immaculate. And that's his payoff. Hello, Roger. No, I'm not gonna tell what happened. No, don't take my pension. Listen, I'm serious. I wasn't gonna tell him. There's one part of the Immaculate Reception that's not for sale, and that's the football. It belongs to Jim Baker, an insurance agent who was part of the crowd that mobbed the field. They kept shoving people back because you couldn't end the game. On a, without kicking the extra point. Down in front of us is the mass of humanity. I headed for the goalpost because they were bringing Girella on. It wasn't a just run in and grab it and run. I had to fight a while for that ball. Word spread like wildfire. Jim Baker has the ball, Jim Baker has the ball. Franco's Italian Army offered me birthday cakes for the rest of my life, which would have been a pretty long time. I turned that down. Later on, I had an offer from a prominent businessman of $150,000. In 2005, Sports Illustrated valued the football at $80,000, a figure Baker finds conservative. Premiums to insure the ball for $1 million were so much money that I could not afford it. The only one that was going to do it was Lloyd's of London. So I figured the next best thing was to protect that ball, I'm going to buy a safe and I bought a big safe. Mm -hmm. 
This bank vault is the centerpiece of my business. In here rests the Immaculate Reception football. A bank vault like this to build today would probably cost you seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. The safe is approximately 20 foot long, eight foot high, poured concrete with a stainless steel door, and it also is fireproof. I get invited to a lot of celebrations with that ball. We are serious about protection. This football doesn't go anywhere without armed security. Don't test them, don't try them. They're licensed and they're packing heat. Coming up, a startling discovery. The version of this play you've undoubtedly seen is from NFL Films, but recently we unearthed the NBC version. If you ever need to prove it in court, roll that tape out. It's absolutely the smoking gun. I get a message from, from Franco every to 23rd of December. Hello? Hey, Phil. Hey, where were you 39 years ago? Is this Franco? You know what I was doing 39 years ago today, Franco? I was making you famous. Don't think he's almighty, Mr. Nice Guy. There's a side of him, too, that loves the Buster Raiders butts. I can always rely on you to ruin my Christmases. It's been 40 years, and with each passing anniversary, the Immaculate Reception only seems to grow bigger. But is the truth out there, and will it ever be found? The man who made the play's name famous certainly thought so. Everybody has the film of uh, the deflection. Myron Cope had seen a film that proved exactly that that ball was above the ground. The ref says it's opal dopal, it's kosher. The network tapes, they were never conclusive. But our own television station had a cameraman at the game and I looked at his film. And a film that has remained practically a secret to this day. I watched that over and over again and it was a legal catch. You might say, well, let me see that film. I didn't pay attention to keeping films and you know television stations, they're apt to throw out some film that's worth a jillion dollars. That shot, like a, a lot of other great shots, ended up where they kept everything that we couldn't use on a day-to-day -day basis. In those days, a great play went from one show to the next, 11 o'clock news, next day's six, the next day's 11. It would be a needle in a haystack. What about the coach's film? Two days after the game, John Madden claimed the All-22 proved Bradshaw's pass struck Fuqua and not Tatum. It, too, has vanished. My position was on the top of the stadium at the 50-yard line. I followed the ball, but at the same time wide enough to see the players around it. Chuck Nolan and the coaching staff asked to see the original copy, and I gave it to them. And whatever they did with the film, I really don't know. The network broadcast of the play was also believed lost. Then, Right before the 1997 AFC Championship game, the tape mysteriously resurfaced. The version of this play you've undoubtedly seen is from NFL Films, but recently we unearthed the NBC version of that play. Here it is, as called by Kirk Gowdy. Last chance for the Steelers. And his pass is broken up by Tatum. Tipped up. It's absolutely the smoking gun. If you ever want, need to prove it in court, roll that tape out. He shoots it out. Jack Tatum deflects it right into the hands of Harris. What else are they gonna say? <laughs> I mean, come on. What else are they gonna say? That's coming from Pittsburgh. It's propaganda. Look at that footage that NBC had, and what you will see is infractions. There's some footage to show Villapiano getting clipped. There's some footage to show that the tip of the ball touched the ground. 
There's some footage to show that Jack Tatum knocked Frenchie Fuqua into the ball. That's what the fact of the matter is. When you talk about Christmas miracles, here's the miracle of all miracles. If the discovery of NBC's cameras could not solve the riddle of the immaculate reception, what could? In the late 1990s, Carnegie Mellon professor John Fetkovich became convinced the answer was science. Ballistically, all we need are Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity to decide the question whether it was a legal play or not. When I finished the analysis, I was astounded. There's still a space between the two. Two players haven't collided yet. If you look carefully at the evidence on the, on the film, the collision between Tatum and Fuqua occurred after the ball already started back. Many of the shots show the football going past Fuqua's head, going past Fuqua while it's still going downfield. The camera is following it. I needed to learn something about how fast and how far a football would rebound. I happened to be looking towards my wife. I had this fleeting thought. I could throw the ball at her as a proxy football player. That thought didn't last long because I knew she wouldn't go for it. I did the experiments outside, throwing the football against the brick wall. The professor's hypothesis was simple. If Bradshaw's pass hit Fuqua, who was running parallel to the line of scrimmage, the ball would have rebounded at roughly the same speed as from a stationary wall. A higher speed would prove that the assassin, Jack Tatum, had struck the ball. The rebound from the brick wall was 12 feet per second. Less than half of the rebound on the football field. A ball striking Fuqua could never reach the speed and distance that you saw on the field. As far as I am concerned, and as far as Newton is concerned, that's it. But as far as the Immaculate Reception goes, why it's so big over time and over space, I don't know. The answer, it turns out, is the question. Everybody loves a mystery. And that's why the Immaculate Reception will always remain unsolved. If you have definitive answers, then it's come to a conclusion, and you forget about it. And we don't want to forget about the Immaculate Reception. And so it continues to be that, quote, mystery of how or why that propels it into the legend that it has become. It would be terrible for football lore if we knew everything that we should know about the play. It's so much better, isn't it, to have a mystery? All great things are myth. It's all stories handed down. Everything about us is myth. You have a 40-year argument that's going to go on for another 40 years. There's no way to prove it one way or the other. I thought we got taken. We should have had that football game, but we didn't get it. Fuqua knows he hit it, and it should have been our game. I would prefer to wait 50 years before I tow, since the doors are locked. And since I can deny this, I don't mind telling you. What happened on that play was truly immaculate.